Today, on Rainbow Country, adventure called Danger Answered. The writer and director of the new Canadian film Brotherhood, Richard Bell. Stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Well, hello, and welcome to a fresh episode of Rainbow Country, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country, a Mark Tara. So this is episode 187 today, the 1926 story about a band of boys arriving at camp for the adventure of a lifetime when a canoe trip turns into a fight for survival. Up next, Writer and director of the new Canadian film Brotherhood, Richard Bell. My battle's keen and bright, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip, and swing. Dip, dip, and swing her back, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip, and swing. This is the Brotherhood of St. Andrews. Hello, boys. Hello, Hello sir. sir. Let's get to work, boys. Woo! At this camp, you'll get out of it what you put in. Games, duty, devotion. Risk builds character, Mr. Langdon. Challenge builds character. This is a leadership camp, not a holiday. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we have a few, we band of brothers, for he today that shed his blood with me shall be my brother. Storyteller, truth seeker, filmmaker. He is writer and director Richard Bell. Hi. Hello. How are you? Wow, I'm loving that introduction. It's very short. No, it's short, cogent, sweet. I'm honored. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for being here in studio Mm -hmm. to have uh, your voice and your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Okay. Let's start here. Uh, A story dating back to 1926, Balsam Lake, about two hours from Toronto. Yes. Brotherhood. You wrote this film. You directed this film. Essentially, what is this film about? Well, Brotherhood is based on the true story of the Brotherhood of St. Andrew Anglican group, uh, which was out of St. James uh, Cathedral here in Toronto. And these boys and some camp leaders uh, assembled on the shores of Balsam Lake at Long Point uh, for two weeks of, uh, of, a, of a leadership camp of watercraft and kite making, marshmallow roasts, all that kind of fun stuff that mm-hmm. we can all relate to. And uh, they set off across Balsam Lake in a 30-foot war canoe, which is a very long and slender canoe. And they were just going across the lake to uh, Cobaconk to pick up supplies. And uh, a summer storm descended on them. Just the summer storm kicked up from nowhere. And uh, they got broadsided by a wave and they went tumbling into the wash. And this story is a survival story about these boys, this band of brothers, trying to survive the evening, uh, clinging to an overturned canoe. So that's what happens in the movie. Um, 
But what it's about is, I think it's a story about masculinity. It's a story about boyhood and manhood. It's very much a story about identity and coming of age, uh, sacrifice, heroism. Um, there's a ticking time clock. It's, uh, ultimately, it's a story about boys becoming men over the course of an evening, uh, trying to stay uh, stay alive and keep their wits Um and it's it's very much informed by the decade preceding it. Um, Canada, of course, was a very young country at the time. We had just come out of the Great War, which is when Canada came of age itself and joined, you know, the Brotherhood of Nations. Really, uh, the two camp counselors were both veterans of the Great War, uh, and they they approach uh, educating and nurturing. Uh, their charges, these young boys, in very different ways. So, um, again, a study of masculinity. Uh, a lot of the boy campers are male archetypes. Um, so we have, uh, like, the rebel, you know, kind of like the River Phoenix, uh, the kid who smokes behind the, the cookhouse. We have the nerd, the wimp, the kid brother, the older brother, the brain. Um, <clears throat> although it's a true story and it's based on real characters, for me it was a study uh, into the whole idea of masculinity and identity. My understanding is that you came to the story in 2006 while you were in Toronto? Yeah, so, yeah. So, here's a question. What was it that was so compelling about this story when you heard about it in 2006 that said, this is going to be my next film? What was so compelling about it? It... it... <sighs> It, it gave me goosebumps when I read this story. It was just a tiny little newspaper article about an 80th anniversary mass that was happening at, in uh, in Kirkfield for these boys. And I just – the story about these boys hanging onto a canoe and these boys giving up their spots on the canoe for the younger boys and trading out places um, – and some of them, you know, even – and this isn't a spoiler, uh, but some of them even just swimming away silently. It made to the – To die. To die. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And and I just thought, you know, at that time, 2006, I think it was like when Facebook was really getting off the ground and everybody – it just became – I felt like – and we still are in, in now, like this Facebook, Instagram kind of like I'm fabulous and you're not culture, which I felt in that story – didn't exist like it was a kind of like people the kind of them being citizens and this kind of like sense of duty and honor and sacrifice and putting others before ourselves uh, i i wondered then and i and i still wonder now if that kind of quiet dignity still exists how would you describe this film is it a docudrama how would you no definitely not i mean i i i shy away from anything with the word docu docu in it like i'm not a documentary filmmaker and this is a true story it's an unknown story i feel like i found buried treasure when i found it i've laid my imagination around the real events okay. and although it's very interesting because when i went back and looked at some of the uh, scanned newspaper articles like years after i had written brotherhood i i was actually quite surprised by how closely i did follow the chain of events um, how how easy or how difficult was it to research um it, it, so i started researching in probably 2010 2011 it's a lot easier now because a lot of the public libraries have scanned the microfiche so in the past where it would have been like you know you're tr feel like you're cracking open the arc arc, arc of the covenant and now it's just you know at your fingertips right so it's a lot easier now i did hire a researcher at uh, the Vancouver Public Library, just when I first started, she found some rudimentary information. But basically, like now, I, you know, as much as I like to complain about technology and as much as I think it distance, distances uh, us from each other, and that's also a theme in the movie, it, it is a great time to be alive and it is a great time to be a filmmaker if you are, you know, a treasure hunter and if you are a truth seeker because that information is at our fingertips. So it wasn't particularly hard to find. The thing that really amazed me was that it was in newspapers all across the world. Like it was in the Sydney Herald. It was in the United States. It was in the United Kingdom. Um, so for such a Canadian kind of provincial story to 
capture the imagination of you know the English speaking world I thought was quite extraordinary. When you were doing your your research, did anything surprise you? Did anything jump out at you? Um, I I would I would say no. Like I, I felt very blessed in the capacity that the the story just the true story had such high drama and such high stakes. Um, I think for me, the biggest aha moment was when I discovered what the story was about in the sense of like what the theme was, you know, like what I described at the beginning of the show is, is what happens in the story. But as a screenwriter and as a storyteller, it behooves me to find out what the theme is, you know, the theme being the cinematic glue that holds the whole thing together. When I was pitching it to producers, they always said, how is this relevant to an audience in modern day? And when I cracked the theme um, that was that was kind of like my aha moment. And for me, the theme was um, the boy crisis, which is, you know, a real time crisis that we're living in now that people have been talking about probably since about the 1990s. And I would say that it it sort of starts with, you know, the Columbine shootings uh, and kind of goes all the way up to, like, say, modern incel culture um, that, you know, that that the state of boyhood um is sort of in a state of jeopardy and that boys are underperforming in schools, that they're listless, they're angry, they're apathetic, they're alone. Uh, they don't know how to be in the 21st century. Um, whereas the manly mannered middle ground, you know, like we don't want toxic masculinity, but, and you know, and I've talked to friends who, female friends who have boys and they don't even know, like, like how, like, you know how how do we raise boys today in a way that's what is what is beautiful manhood and you know there's no easy answer to that right yeah um so cracking that i think was <clears throat> my aha moment i read this book called real boys um and then also another book called last child in the woods which is about nature deficit disorder um, which is uh, a philosophy that not just boys, boys and girls, like children need to return to being in nature mm -hmm. and how curative nature is. And and then another book that I uh, researched was called uh, Iron John, which is a story of myth, uh, manhood through myth. And uh, that was like a, a big moment for me as well. So how long did it take to make this film? From stem to stern, probably about nine years, a very, very long time. So um, it's making uh, – th this is my second film and <clears throat> there's a saying in North America that making your first film is easy and making your second film is hard and that's true. That's really true. My first film was uh, called 18. Um, it had uh, – it had a uh, gay content. It you know was narrated by Sir Ian McKellen and had gay characters in it, and uh, it was very hard for me to get, off, get get that film off the ground in two thousand five, two thousand six because of the queer content in the movie and because it sort of made people feel uncomfortable. And it was interesting that my film that I did after that was Brotherhood, which is kind of like more traditional old Hollywood film, which is basically kind of like straight and you know, quote unquote heteronormative and about a bunch of white guys. And, and whereas now we're living in a culture and there's more of an appetite for queer stories. So for me, you know, you can't predict what's going to be the next big thing. Right. And, um, but for me, it's kind of interesting because I'm like sitting here, you know, going into the 2020s going, I think I made, might've made my movies in reverse. This tragedy took place in 1926. Yes. And, I'm curious to know, have you heard from any of the the ancestors of yeah. the, the people that passed away? Well, that's a great question because I just did. And I had a feeling that people were going to start coming out of the woodwork as the film like started gaining traction. But it was interesting because I was just at a screening in Halliburton, which is this tiny community that's nestled between Algonquin Park and... Cottage and, country. Yeah, and Cobacog. And yeah. Cobacog is where the boys were headed. So um, it felt very apt and very poignant to present it to the community there. And um, a couple of days before the festival, the festival director contacted me and said, you know, Arthur Lambden, uh, his niece has been in touch with us. And Arthur Lambden's played by Brendan Fletcher in the movie. And I was really kind of nervous. I was like, oh, no, like, what is she going to expect? And, you know, like... It is It is a true story. It is based on real events. And I didn't, you know, 
creator uh, creator uncle. I created my version of Arthur Lambden, and, and it's not even my version anymore. It's Brendan Fletcher's version of Arthur Lambden. And uh, so she came to the screening and she had like three pages prepared of a, of a speech. But the festival director stopped her from doing that and just said, you know, let's focus on the movie and focus on Richard. And she did say a poem that uh, Arthur had written after the tragedy in 1926. So that felt very moving and appropriate. Um, she didn't really say much to me. I know that she liked the film. I mean, God bless her. She was probably like 85 years old. Um, she did say, I'm so glad that Arthur has a mustache in this movie because he had a mustache his entire life. And it's also really funny because Brendan Fletcher, we cast him quite late. We cast him about a week before we started shooting and he texted me a picture of him. He's also from Vancouver and he had a mustache mm -hmm. uh, in the picture. And he's like, what do you think of the mustache? Because he had found an old picture of Arthur Lambden sporting a mustache. And I was like, no, absolutely not. And it was actually my producer who said, no, I like the mustache. And I was like, yeah, it might be good because Brendan Fletcher has a bit of a baby face and, you know, you want something to differentiate him from the boys. And so anyway, the mustache saved the day with uh, the descendant of Arthur Lambden. Well said, Richard Bell. <laughs> On that note, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Bill 7, to ban discrimination in employment, government services and housing based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former cabinet minister and MPP, Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. My name is Charles Officer, and I'm the writer and director of Invisible Essence, The Little Prince. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Director of photography. Let's talk about Adam Swicka. Adam Swicka, yeah. And the process that you went through apparently to hire him because I understand that he wasn't necessarily your first choice yeah. to come on board. So talk to me about I'm so impressed. You have that. done your research. Um, the I, I, uh, I interviewed two directors of photography and both of them were, are, were totally top notch. Um, one was a female who, um, it was incredibly capable and very talented and she and I really clicked in the meeting, uh, and she kind of made me cry in, in, in the interview because she really understood the world of these characters and what I wanted to do. And she even had this beautiful suggestion for a very short scene in the movie, which I did take her up on that suggestion and, and it's, it's a very poignant scene, um, and I was uh, about to hire her. Uh, the interesting thing with Adam is that when we met, uh, he and I didn't click. And he was kind of talking like in a lot of technical ways and and uh, a lot of tech speak. And I was just like, I don't get it. I'm not following it. And and it was really funny because I, I wasn't – we weren't going to hire him for that reason. And, and even my producer was like, oh, you two totally didn't click. You're like, you didn't hit it off. But I did admire his work and it's funny because I was having coffee with a friend like afterwards and I said, you know, I'm trying to decide between these two directors of photography. They both bring something different to the table and, um, you know, I really like this guy's work and he's very tech minded. And, and, and my friend said to me, he goes, well, who do you choose? The, the person whose work you like or the, uh, the person who you get along with better? And Okay, maybe that was, to answer your earlier question, the surprise moment. Well, I guess there's been many surprise moments. But I was like, yeah, like – and the 
the analogy that I used when describing it to my producer was, and I'm a bit, bit of a Star Trek nerd here. I was just like, I with the other f- cinematographer, I felt like I had met another Captain Kirk, and I'm Captain Kirk, and Captain Kirk doesn't need another Captain Kirk. He needs a Spock, and so I wanted to hire Adam. And I changed my mind about him because he had the technical expertise to pull off shooting on water, shooting with kids, shooting with light, shooting with cranes and two cameras. And and Adam got his start in light, uh, working uh, in the lighting department. And so much about this movie involves light and natural light and lightness and darkness. Uh, it was very interesting that as we began the Brotherhood journey together, I realized that uh, he was like, you know, he had the heart and soul of a poet and was really – really understood the 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 texture of the movie and the texture of the emotions and could really it's so funny because when I first met him like it was all very scientific and talky and techy but then when we got to know each other and we started working together very closely because like there was a lot of planning involved in this movie I was like oh man this guy's like from another era this man's like a great poet and and so we spoke the same language and and because we had such a short short uh, shoot on this, it was it was really important that we were in simpatico. How long was the shoot? The actual shoot? I've been I, I you know what Adam and my assistant director begged me not to tell people because they don't want to have a reputation for working that fast. Okay. No one does. But let's just say that it could have been longer. I could have used a lot more time. I don't know. Like for me, so that, why why was it so short? It was just a matter of like finances. Okay. Like it's just you know like ultimately we live in Canada and you know it, it's just very difficult to finance a film. It's almost impossible these days. It takes many many miracles. Um, it's a lot more competitive now. Uh, all these funds are oversubscribed, and you just only have a certain amount of time. That being said, I actually really enjoyed working that way. I had a blast. And I think probably because the film was in Genesis for so long and because I had done so much homework, I had a very, very like articulated lookbook that had color palette, that had sketches. You know, I just would hire people off Craigslist to do these sketches for me. Like the world was very much designed. And so um, it was – there was a shorthand between me and Adam or between me and my AD. There was almost kind of like a triumvirate, uh, you know, with the three of us just being able to work really quickly. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed – um, just kind of shooting from the hip, and I wasn't shooting from the hip because I had we had done so much prep work. Um, also, just kind of casting well. Uh, we like the casting director and I were very focused on hiring. Uh, I mean, I've said it a hundred times, but I wanted to hire actors who would make my life easier and not harder. And also kids who are kind of like hockey players, just which is so funny to say because I was such an unathletic kid. But like I needed kids who could just um, guys who could just rough and tumble and throw themselves in the water mm-hmm. and, you know, not be afraid of the physicality of the movie because there's just so much physicality on location. Well, speaking of water, talk to me about safety and filmmaking. Um, we were just very cognizant of uh, keeping everybody safe. And the second I found out that someone couldn't swim on a movie that involved so much water work and so much swimming, mm-hmm. uh, and we're also doing, you know, we're also creating this, you know, tale about, you know, water. I mean, water safety sounds too academic, but like, you know, it's like the last thing we needed was like someone getting hurt or injured. And also because we had so many minors involved and, um, you know, our AD really wanted to run a tight ship. Yeah. So Richard Bell, earlier you were talking about this particular book, but a book about men uh, by American poet Robert Bly, published in 1990, mm-hmm. Iron John. Yeah. Talk to me about why you chose this book to give to your cast members and why did you do that? Like, what did you want them to get from that book to inform them when it came to acting in in your movie? Why did you do that? Um, Like, I'm an old theater school kid. I went to drama school from the ages of like 18 to 22 or 23 and 
I think that really um, formed who I am as a director and as an actor's director. And I like I don't because I went to a very strict theater school. Um, uh, it, I don't really like lazy actors. I, I like my actors to be um, just really like strong and with it and just not faking it and I like authentic performances and I like um, my actors to be educated and uh, it was funny because my casting director said like I gave the actors a reading list and I don't know if all of them read the books Um, but we did do this exercise where we did a team building exercise where we went to this cottage in the woods uh, in mono and we sat around a campfire and I had cut up the pages of the book into sentences Mm. and uh, everybody just had to take a sentence from 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 a cap and uh, and read it out loud you know around the campfire and we would just ruminate it on it you know for a few moments and then maybe talk about it or maybe not and um, you know, it's. I guess it sounds a bit mystical and, and magical and maybe a bit kumbaya, but I feel like – I don't know what that does, but I feel like it does something. And I feel like that uh, translates on film and, 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 you know, with the feedback I've gotten, like with people, like what they've said to me, like I think that there is a real camaraderie and esprit de corps amongst the boys and I think that that sparkle is there. Uh, and I think that that is because of the team building experiences and, and because we – I mean I wouldn't say we workshopped Iron John, but we definitely explored some of the themes within it. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about the look of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, moments in the film – and this is just coming from me, little gay old me mm-hmm. and the little gay part of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There were moments in the film where, especially f- focusing on on the young men in their 1920s swimsuits right. frolicking on the beach, right. there were moments when, for me, it reminded me of Pet Shop Boys' music video for Being Boring. Oh, wow. I love that video. Directed by fashion photographer Bruce Weber. Yeah. Were you conscious of capturing, say, young men's sensuality when it came to those scenes? Were you, was that something that you were conscious of? Oh, yeah. I was definitely conscious of it. I think any story or movie that kind of involves a bunch of guys who are good looking, who are palling around, and, you know, as I mentioned, the camaraderie and all that kind of stuff is going to smack of a certain homoeroticism. Uh and so I knew that uh, I didn't – I wouldn't say that I wrote any homoerotica into the movie I, because I just knew that it was just going to happen, right? Like there was, there was going to be some kind of like a bit of, you know, Abercrombie. Your horse playing. Yeah, it's, there's going to be a certain amount of Abercrombie and Fitchness to, to, you know, the camaraderie. So it wasn't just me. No, it wasn't just you. The thing that was interesting, though, was that I had people who read the script who kind of like were trying to – who were discouraging me from having moments like that, who would say things like, oh, that's going to be a bit gay or, you know, people are going to think that directors – And what's wrong with that? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, I, to be honest with you, I actually thought the movie was going to turn out more homoerotic than it did. Do you tell. Well, I, I – <laughs> You know, and I think that's probably because of the actors. I think I'm pretty sure that all the actors are straight. And I think that just the choices that they made were kind of informed by heterosexual actors. Um, so so it was just kind of interesting. So I, I, I get more of kind of like a hockey team kind of feel camaraderie to their joshing and razzing uh, than I do – like a Herb Ritzian kind of homoerotic, you know, but, but I don't, I don't mind that people see that. Like it's, it's, we, it's there. I guess we, we all see it through our own individual lenses. And for me, like the pleasure now as this movie goes out into the world is seeing the movie through other people's eyes. There's this story I remember about this English professor who said, I wish I could read Romeo and Juliet for the very first time. And, and for me, it's like I wish I could read or I could see Brotherhood for the very first time. The closest I can come to that is when I talk to someone like you who says, you know, 
because I, I kind of forgot about that. Like, but it's there. And, and it, so that's, that's a real gift for me. Are you happy with the film? Oh, I'm totally happy with the film. The thing that I, um, the thing that surprises me the most about Brotherhood is how much it turned out the way I wanted it. That that kind of shocks me. And I remember when we wrapped and I went back to Vancouver, I, I went – I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I can't believe how how it turned out the way I wanted it to. And, you know, post-production was very rough for me and um, it wasn't my favorite time. Uh, but coming out on the other end, the movie turned out the way I wanted it to and I'm totally happy with it. And you know what? To be honest with you, if I never make another movie again, I could live with that. Because I would rather I would rather make the movie I want and never do it again than compromise and make a movie that I'm not happy with just to keep working. Why was post production so difficult for you? It was Challenging. just well, it was difficult in the sense that production is the most exciting time because there's a full army there and everybody has the same singular purpose. And all of a sudden, the story that's been, you know, gestating in your mind is now everybody's story. So the costume designer is coming to me with pictures and, you know, the production designer is showing me a picnic basket or a fishing rod. And, and the, you know, speaking of camaraderie and esprit de corps, there's that. There's everybody is moving in one direction to create this piece of work and everybody's on board when production wraps everybody goes away like everybody goes away and it almost i mean not everybody like the relationships i had in post-production were very special in the sense that i worked with sarah petty my editor for many months and she became like where adam was like my boyfriend on set now sarah petty became my girlfriend in post-production and then Sarah w went away and, and then I worked with William Rousen, my composer, in Vancouver. And, and we worked out of the Vancouver School of Music and that was a great experience working with him. And then I worked with my sound mixer and we would spend weeks together. But apart from those very close working relationships, it felt like everybody sort of disappeared. And that's not entirely true but it's it's it becomes a lot it's, and it's not even solitary but it i i miss production because i i felt i felt the wave and the power and the energy of uh, of an ensemble did you feel abandoned um gee <laughs> to put the pieces together now I think the thing that I liked the most about production was that we were on a schedule and mm -hmm. post-production, there was no schedule. Mm -hmm. It went on for like a year and 10 months. But didn't you have an end date? We didn't really. Okay. And with Brotherhood and I think probably with a lot of Canadian films, you just start running out of money. Okay. And you can't – like like production is – everything is organized and detailed to the nth degree, uh, whereas post-production was more like – freeballing it mm -hmm. and so it didn't go as fast as i wanted it to go mm -hmm. and uh for me sometimes that was excruciating well said mm -hmm. honest <laughs> on that note let's take a break okay we'll be right back Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 895 FM, discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us, um, and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally and right here in Toronto, and and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls, and you're listening to Rainbow Country on CIUT 89.5 FM.
Richard Bell, Brotherhood is your second film, correct? Yes. Did you always want to be a filmmaker? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I like to say that I didn't choose it. It chose me. I have been making little mini movies since I was probably 12 or 13, like with the camcorder. Um, I think my first film was in grade seven. And I remember it got into this tiny, like, student film and video festival in Vancouver. I lived in the suburbs. And I remember getting on the bus with my grandma and going to uh, Robson Square to see it. It was kind of like a it was like a World War Three movie, and it had all these stop motion cars exploding. And when I went on the screen, people laughed. <laughs> people laughed, and I was like sitting there in the audience, thinking, "This is all very serious." Um, but uh, yeah, no, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker, absolutely. And even like when I went to drama school, like I think I went to drama school because, like, well, I was involved in a lot of school plays in high school. Um, because we didn't really have a film and TV program um, like there is now. And so I was in all the high school plays, and then I went to Studio 58, um, uh, the theater school after that. And it was – by the time I got out of drama school, going to drama school had convinced me that I was probably the worst actor ever. Like, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The teachers were very strict. Um, they've loosened up a lot since and more kids graduate now. <laughs> but my graduating class had three people. Like we started with 15 and we ended up with three. Wow. So going to drama school made me feel like the worst actor ever. Um, and I didn't really want to do it. And I – but I'd always wanted to be a filmmaker. And – you know, it sounds a little silly to say it now, but like I remember seeing Titanic in 1997 and it was before Leo Mania and before, you know, Celine Dion like mm. banging her chest and before it became super mainstream. I mean, it was always mainstream, but I think I went opening night and I remember seeing that and just going, oh, that's just so what I want to do. Like, like I love epics and my favorite films are like David Lean's epics, like Lawrence of Arabia, okay. Bridge on the River Kwai. Um, classics. And yeah, I love, I love, I love classics. I, I, I love that old Hollywood sort of classic look. What do you think about remaking those classics? Um, uh, not They've a recently remade Ben Hur. Yeah. Not a fan. Um, you know, I I do I did like the Spartacus TV series. Uh, oh, maybe that's because of the homoeroticism. But um, uh, I'm not a fan of I'm not a fan of remakes. Mm. Really, no, I can't think of a remake that I am a fan of. I I you know it's the whole don't gild the lily thing. It's like, like yeah. why mess with yeah. per perfection. And even like it, it's funny because my younger brother, he's a 90s kid and he like excitedly went and saw the Lion King remake and the Aladdin remake. And he's like, it was great. And I was like, I would never, ever watch those in a million years. Like why remake things that are just so perfect? I hear people talking about remaking Back to the Future. I'm like, why? Why would you remake Back to the Future? It is perfect the way it is. So – um, but, you know, it's it's worrisome and it's worrisome as an independent director, independent filmmaker, because no one wants news stories anymore. Um, and, you know, it really is. I mean, this isn't new. Nothing I'm saying here is new, but it's, you know, the superhero movies and and all that kind of stuff. And there definitely is a place for that. Like, I'm all for popcorn movies, um, but I, I'm worried uh, – uh, original stories have moved to television and to streaming, which is good. Uh, I'm still a film lover. I, I love the idea of like an hour and a half, two hour mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so I, I'm worried about the state of cinema, but you know, all I can do is you know keep my nose to the grindstone and do my thing. So, 2005, 18, mm -hmm. your first film. Uh, you were nominated for a Genie Award for Best Achievement in in Music, Original Song. Yeah. Sir Ian McKellen narrates 18? Yeah. There has to be a story behind that. <laughs> oh, right? there's a great story. Can you share? Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> um, Sir Ian McKellen? Yeah, and Ian McKellen was Ian McKellen then because he had like just done the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? So – 
Um, 18 is a story about a street kid in modern day and his grandfather uh, in the Second World War. And it's the conceit is that the, the grandfather leaves his World War II memoirs on audio cassette for this street kid. And I was able to get Ian McKellen to be the voice of the grandfather talking to the grandson. Now, when you're young, like I was in my 20s, you think you can do anything and therefore you can so I met Ian McKellen at a party during TIFF in probably like 2003 and I said to him that who I was and what I was trying to do in this movie I was working on and uh, I think I kind of point blank asked him. It, it also helped because I had met Alan Cumming who's also in 18 about uh, three years before when he was shooting a movie in Vancouver and Ian and Alan are good friends. So Alan put in a good word for me and uh, yeah, that was quite the coup getting Ian McKellen and, and but it was so crazy because he was doing a play in Sydney, Australia and I had to fly there to record him doing this narration and I remember going there with no money and then he wasn't getting back to me so then I went to a play the play he was doing and I talked my way backstage and I ended up meeting him and he's like okay I'll do it tomorrow and I was like I have to make arrangements so we went to Fox Studios in Sydney and um I had to he's like you'll pick me up in the morning and I was like I'm going to rent a car and a driver to do this and we just went there and we worked together for 45 minutes. He laid down the track maybe three or four times. Then I dropped him off at his hotel and that was the last time I saw him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Like we didn't become friends or anything afterwards. Yeah. That was the last time I saw him. And I remember calling my producer saying, I got it. I got the narration. And we were like, wow. So if even if 18 doesn't work out, at least we have like a three minute you know, radio play with Ian McKellen. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was amazing. And I can't even believe that I asked him to do it, but he did it. And he it was, said, yes, he said, yes, he's a great, he's a, he's a great guy. He's, he's an amazing guy. And I think that he's, he's, um, he's very interested in, in nurturing young, young talent and, and Alan coming. I mean, I haven't seen Alan in a million years either, but Alan was very generous. And when he did 18, I think he got, scale minus 35 percent or something and so you know he was definitely it it, it was really great and it and it, made, it gave the movie a lot of leverage and it, it gave the movie a lot of legs and I, I i can't even i can't even believe that was me that was going around trying to do that kind of stuff do you think sir ian mckellen did your film because of the the gay content the lgbt content I'm not too sure. No, I would. I, I don't even know if he knew about the gay content in it. Um, I think he did it. I think he did it because he liked me. Mm. Yeah, he just. I don't know. Maybe he saw something in me. And and honestly, it really helped that Alan was involved. But it was a great night that when I met him at TIFF because um, it was a, a party. I think it was like uh, I don't know. It was like a party at Church in Wellesley. Oh, I think it was a party for that movie Emil that he did. That's directed by Carl Basai. And I think I just sat down at his table. It was like a picnic table outside. And Stephen Fry was at the table too. And I was just being my I don't know. I guess probably drunk, charming self, or I thought I was being my charming self. And I just chatted with them. And then by the and then and then uh and then by the end they were like, oh, Alan's in Richard's gonna be in Richard's movie. He hasn't mm -hmm. asked us. So I remember even asking Stephen Fry if he would play a small part okay. in 18. And his people were interested, but I remember it was it was SAG I think, um, or the UBCP union in BC that, that said you can only have so many SAG actors in the movie. With Alan Cummings, did you meet him in Vancouver because of the X-Men movie? He was shooting Josie and the Pussycats okay. in the year 2000. Okay. And I, um, he, it was like opening night at the Vancouver International Film Festival and there was a party somewhere. And I went up to him. I guess I do have a bit of a – or I did have a bit of an incorrigible streak. And you know that movie? He was in GoldenEye, the James Bond movie. Okay. And in the late 90s, there was a video game that was like a video for Nintendo. And he's a character in the video mm. game. And I had been playing it and I mm. shot him by accident. <laughs> and he's a good guy and you're not supposed to shoot him. And my entree to him, I went up to him and I said – 
because uh, everybody was kind of fawning over him because he had just won the Tony Award for Cabaret. And I went up to him and I was just like, oh, I was playing Goldeneye the other day and I accidentally blew you away. And he, with his Scottish impish accent, he was like, what a terrible thing to say to someone. And then he was like, drink. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so that's how I met him. So when audiences see Brotherhood, what do you want them to come away with after they've seen your film? Um, I want people to walk away with the movie from the movie. I mean, thematically, it 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 really is an exploration of masculinity in its many different varied forms. So that doesn't mean that it's the film is just for guys. Like that's like saying like Dead Poets Society is just for guys or Stand by Me is just for guys. Uh, however, I, I do worry about the state of boyhood these days, and I worry about our boys today, and I do hope that boys c- coming out of it, uh, I hope it makes them want to be better men. I have, Actually, I hope it makes men want to be better men, because I think that um, I think that we have some problems right now, and we have some challenges, and uh, I think that we can be better. And I think that looking at a movie from yesteryear about yesteryear that feels current in the sense that we can be better we can do more the definition i heard once of the word character is that character is what you do when no one is looking and that means a lot to me it's not about what we show people on instagram or facebook or twitter um, it's not what we demonstrate. It's what we do in those private moments when no one is looking. No one is going to congratulate us for doing that. Um, and I think that what these boys exhibited on that night in 1926 was true character. And I think that I hope that it inspires. Like what I remember when I saw Saving Private Ryan, I was living in Toronto in, in the 90s. And I remember walking out of that movie going, okay, there's no war going on, but I'm going to join the Peace Corps. Like, and I didn't, of course. I didn't join the Peace Corps. And maybe the feeling didn't last. But in that moment, I felt – and maybe it affected me in another way. But it, that movie made me want to be a better person. And that's not my favorite movie of all time. But I do feel like movies can inspire us uh, to, to be just a little bit better than we were yesterday. Well said, Richard Bell. Before I let you go, mm-hmm. three quick questions. Mm. Oh, like rapid fire ones? Yes. Or? Oh, I love rapid fire. Are you ready? Do you want a sip of water first? Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Red or white? The color? I usually think of it oh, as booze. Oh, as wine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've been sober for 11 years. So I... So I think of it as color. Yeah, no, I stopped drinking 11 years ago. However, I do recall that a bad white wine is drinkable, but a r- bad red wine is undrinkable. So I think that I would choose white. Day or night? Night. Ugh. I just even just flying into Toronto yesterday, like I caught a flight at like five o'clock. So it was already dark in Vancouver. And like the flight was not super packed because it was nighttime and all the lights were out. And everybody was just kind of like nestled into their own little private spots. And when I arrived in Toronto, it wasn't busy and I wasn't climbing over anyone. And it just I even I like driving at night because there's just less people. I just feel like there's more clarity and quietness at night. Camping or glamping? Um, <laughs> wow. I'm gonna, I'm sorry to say this because I was a cub and I was a beaver and I was a boy scout. Were you ever an otter? I wasn't. I think I'm an otter now. No. <laughs> Most guys think I'm a muskrat. Um, no, uh, I would have to say glamping because. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is, uh, I don't know who said this, W.C. Fields. I don't know. Dorothy Parker. I feel like my idea of roughing it is a hotel without room service. I am very much uh, where I am now in my life. I'm just all about the creature comforts. Even when we shot in Wawa, I was like, I want my own space. I want 
you know, I don't want to be I want to be near the actors, but not on top of the actors. I want it to be private. So I, I think I'd be glamping. Well said. Mm. Richard Bell, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. My battle's keen and bright, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip, and swing. Dip, dip, and swing her back, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip, and swing. All right, boys. This is the Brotherhood of St. Andrew. Hello, boys. Hello, sir. Let's get to work, boys. At this camp, you'll get out of it what you put in. Games, duty, devotion. Risk builds character, Mr. Langdon. Challenge builds character. This is a leadership camp, not a holiday. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that shed his blood with me shall be my brother. I'm Sondra Urian. And I'm Danny Bensey. And you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Again, a special thanks to writer and director Richard Bell for joining me on episode 187 of Rainbow Country. If you would like to see Brotherhood in theaters, here is your chance. If you are in Ontario, Brotherhood will be showing in Sault Ste. Marie, February 29th, Bracebridge, March 9th, Alora. March 13th to the 19th, and Waterloo, Ontario, March 28th and 29th. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. You just heard the bumper featuring Sonda Urian and Danny Bensey, musicians and film composers who have scored such TV projects and film projects like Ozark, American Gods Season 2, the film Boy Erased, and a new series that's airing Sundays on HBO, The Outsider, based on the novel by Stephen King. If you haven't had a chance to see The Outsider as of yet, I highly recommend you do. And you will not be disappointed. It is powerful powerful storytelling. The Outsider airs Sundays on HBO. Don't forget to keep up to date with all things country, rainbow country. Follow me on socials at Mark Tara Music. Do you have a show idea, a guest suggestion? Send me an email, mark at marktara.com. The podcast for Rainbow Country is is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And the official Rainbow Country playlist is on Spotify. And of course, everything is hooked up at my website, marktara.com. Finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we live in days of making dreams come true. So believe in yourself, and the world will believe in you. 
Hi, I'm Mary John Torrey, and you're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. Mm-hmm. 